So my name is Mosarche, I work for the RHEL crypto team. Um, and talk is why you shouldn't write cryptographic algorithms yourself. Let's get to it. So everyone tells you that, right? You shouldn't write your own crypto. But usually they don't tell you why. And I could tell you. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so instead, uh, this morning we're going through uh, a little exercise how we could write the RSA function ourselves. And I choose RSA because I recently had to refresh my memory on it due to a nice, a nice little CVE that came in. So let's get started. So this is fundamentally RSA. It's a pretty straightforward function. This is the encryption function. So C is the, your ciphertext. And all you need to do is take your message, exponent shade it to be the E exponent, which is called the public exponent, and then do a modulus. This is also, by the way, uh, the way you do signatures at the same time. And this is how you decrypt the message. You take the ciphertext you generated, exponent shade it with the private exponent, modulus again, and you get back your message. Right? And I assure you, there are no tricks. That's really what is the basis of RSA. It's just that simple function, or is it? So we need to look a little bit at those useless details people talk about a little bit, you know, when trying to implement crypto stuff. So first of all, we need to figure out if the function we saw is enough. And it isn't. Like there are mathematical attacks on that, uh, on that kind of functions, and we need to be aware of them to be able to actually build something that is secure. And very basic things are um, attacks like common modules. So when you want to create a private key in RSA, you create two big uh, numbers called P and Q, they multiply together, you get a modulus, and then you derive uh, your public and private exponent and stuff like that. In the end, what you do, you create two keys, a public and a private key. And, what, and because, at least back in the time, it was kind of time consuming to build a private key, uh, some people thought, well, maybe we share some of the you know, parameters, we can speed up uh, key creation, we'll have someone to distribute the private keys to people and you know that will be faster, but that was broken. So never reuse parameters, always generate new fresh keys. Um, another thing is that uh, people want to be able to decrypt fast. Uh, because oftentimes, especially if you store stuff on disk, you write once, so encryption is not that big of a deal, but you want to read many times. So if decryption is fast, it's nice. And you can that by having a small private exponent because then you don't need to exponent shade it off right, uh, to, to get your uh, message. Except that if you use a small exponent, you break the crypto system. So you have to have a larger private exponent to do that. And so and again, when you create your private keys, you have to be a little bit careful. Conversely, a small public exponent. If you want to have fast encryption, then maybe I have a small exponent there so that it will be fast to encrypt stuff to me. Again, if it's too small, like three, which was used for quite a while, like literally the number three, uh, then it's kind of broken. But if you use at least two to the 16, uh, uh, it's, it's fine. And that's what's commonly actually used. Uh, however, that's not enough. Uh, because RSA has a fixed size of the message that you can encrypt, and that corresponds to the length of the key, you also have to do some padding. And that if you randomize, because if you don't, you break our say again. So there are a bunch of details, and you can search for this paper called 20 Years of Attacks on the RSA Crypto System. Um, and it will give all the details you want to know and all the pointers to other papers to go in deep in the mathematics if you want to. So if you follow all of these things, we can do it, right? We're going to write it. Uh, wait a second. Now. First of all, <laughs> the equation is very simple, but I didn't say that it uses really, really, really big numbers. Uh, so you cannot really use your uh, floating point Unix in a, in a CPU, for example, to deal with it because you need perfect precision, and floating point units are uh, imprecise. And 
So you have to write or find uh, an arbitrary precision library uh, to deal with these huge numbers. And we are talking numbers along 1,000 bits, 2,000 bits, 4,000 bits, or 8,000 bits or more. So they are really, really big, several, several uh, hundred bytes uh, for each single number. You also need a prime number generator because you need to generate keys if you want to do any, any work. Uh, so, and that has to be a good one, has to have good tests for primality to make sure that it's actually a prime number because if you don't use prime numbers in it, say, it's broken. And you also need a, a also good GS, yeah, cryptographic secure set random generator normally because you, we use more random during uh, uh, the uh, encryption and decryption. So assuming we will do all that and we cheat a little bit because we choose uh, GMP, GNU, multi-precision arithmetic library, I choose this one because that's uh, uh, the library is using Nettle, which is a project I was working for uh, to fix this CDE. Then we cheat a little bit because the math is handled there, and this is how you decrypt the virus say. Pretty simple, right? It's just a single function call. Done. Right? Okay, yeah. But this is a bit uh, slow, and your users might get a little bit of patience if you use just this one. So you go ahead and say, okay, let's try to make it a little bit faster so at least people can actually use it. And use a little bit of math. I'm not going to explain what it is, but it has to do with Chinese reminder theorem and other thing to make the private exponent small again, but in a non-provably secure way. non proven in the sense that nobody has proven it's broken, but there's also no proof that it's not broken, but in 20 years nobody found uh, problem with this approach and so we are fine. And so now our simple function is just a little bit longer, 10 times as long, right? Okay, right, so it's not a, still not a big deal. With this we still decrypt or sign uh, uh, a message, so I think we're fine, right? Okay, maybe we're fine, maybe not. I think we should go back to the paper I mentioned and, and read a little bit more because we read about the math, but we didn't read what happens when you actually implement stuff the way I showed. So there are a few things you need to, uh, to, uh, to consider when writing something like this. Uh, math can be used not only to break the math crypto system, but also to analyze the implementation and find if the implementation has faults, and then use those faults to uh, recover keys. So there are at least three famous attacks that I'm just going to mention very briefly. Uh, one is timing attacks, uh, meaning that if you just you know, run the function with normal math, depending on what the key is, you will have different things happening inside the CPU. And an attacker can actually time how you do things and recover your key. And so uh, Revis, which is one of the guys behind the acronym RSA, immediately found a way to defeat the attack and using blinding and we'll see later what blinding means. Uh, so that can be taken care of. Another problem is random faults. So believe it or not, computers sometimes have bugs in their CPUs. Uh, mathematical libraries have bugs and people make you know, mistakes in general. Uh, the problem is, we better say, if you have a mistake in the map and you get it wrong, uh, like uh, the wrong signature, for example, in case you're making a signature rather than decrypting, uh, then, and you then send out this signature broken, then you broke an RSA. Uh, with enough bad signature, you can recover uh, the, the private keys again. So you have to be careful, but that's easy. You will check that the signature is right, and you're done. And finally, one of the most famous, uh, Blake and Bucker, I hope I say it right, attacks on PKCS. One, the KCS one is, is basically uh, one of the standard ways of doing padding. As I said before, RSA can only sign or encrypt messages of fixed size, but you usually want to send you know, random stuff. So what you do, you just have some padding to your message so you can reach the size of the key. So even if your message is small, or if your message is large, you can in pieces, but at some point you will have to put some padding to complete the size of the key. 
Uh, depending on how you do that and how you handle errors in case of decryption, uh, you may get into trouble and the can find ways to basically recover uh, enough information on the state of the machine to recover the keys again. So you have, really have to be careful about these things. And our function, which now is uh, in here basically, the 10 lines of code, is not enough. So you have to do a little bit more stuff. So we cheat a little bit again. We say that we have just one function that will generate a very good random to uh, satisfy, to do the blinding. And blinding is uh, a way to uh, avoid timing attacks, how timing attacks work. If you have a server like TLS, <coughs> it means you can keep sending stuff to the server because the server is there to serve requests by clients. And that means you have an oracle. It means that the server will keep trying to decrypt, you know, clients and the stuff to them. And if you can repeat the operation over and over, you can basically time what happens into the machine, statistically, not a single operation. Um, and because you can send always the same message, you can time precisely always the same uh, decryption if you don't do anything, or the same signature verification, depending on the protocol. Um, so in order to have always a different computation, such that the state cannot recover the statistical methods, you basically multiply stuff with a random number, and then you do your computation, and then you multiply by the inverse, and so a bunch of math, bunch of math, and yourself. Uh, and now our code is twice as big as before. But still, yeah, okay. Then we have to also check our signatures for random faults and stuff like that. So more or less as before, we just do some checking. And luckily for us, because the public, public exponent is small, we can just do an exponentiation without having, needing any tricks to make it fast. And we just check that our signature is okay. And so we've done that as well. Only two extractions more which is a cheat because underneath there is a, uh, the mathematical library there's a bunch of stuff, but let's say it's just plus two. And then from Leckenbacher, one of the defense that is using TLS is pretty simple. If you get an error in the decryption because TLS uses this, uh, they are saying mostly just to uh, share session keys, we just pretend that, this, uh, uh, that the uh, decryption is actually successful, we generate a random session key and we keep using it and the attacker doesn't know whether this uh, is the right key or not. And so it, it, it cannot gain uh, a lot of information about the state. We done yet? No. I'm not impressed. <laughs> so now comes the, run, the, the fun stuff that I had to deal with. Uh, something that uh, Anders also mentioned, side channel attacks. This is all the rage. If you've seen, you know, uh, recent CPU, uh, issues with uh, you know speculation. You don't have to go all the way to speculation though to do side channel attacks. With modern CPUs, caches are actually uh, shared, you know, within a core, and you can do run nice tricks like forcing the CPU to dump caches and then inspect whether a cache line was actually loaded by trying to load it and see how much time it takes. Basically, you can measure what another process is doing if you really know what to look for. And that measuring, when it comes to RSA, is bad. Because it's basically just like the timing attack, and other attack like that. So we kind of go back to the drawing board a little bit. And a few researchers uh, late last year came out with this uh, paper, the, ten, the Nine Lives of Black and Black Cat, which showed that basically most TLS implementations were uh, affected where it could be broken locally on the local machine. You cannot do that over the network. However, if you use maybe even virtualization, but if you use containers, or if you have root processes running a TLS server, but you also have users on the same system, you are in the local case. And so you can attack uh, other processes uh, with these methods. So how do we go? or try to defeat uh, cache and time attacks. Uh, the problem with these attacks is that your CPU is doing work that can be measured by someone else. So we need to make the CPU do work so that every time you measure it, it's always exactly the same regardless of what you're doing, meaning regardless of the inputs that the attacker is sending you. Uh, so the attacker is trying to uh, send, you know, 
messages to a TLS server in another process and trying to measure what happens on the CPU at the same time. So, uh, well, we need to go all the way down to the mathematic library, first of all, to solve these issues, because if the mathematic library takes one millisecond to do one exponentiation and 10 milliseconds to do another, depending on what are the inputs, that's wrong, because as I said, they have to take the same time. Luckily for us, in the sense me, when I was <laughs> writing uh, fixes, uh, the GMP library already has a bunch of functions that are lower level, and not a, the, the, uh, the, the more abstract, abstract interface, they are called underbar, stack underbar, uh, which hopefully means that they are uh, safe from the point of view of always taking the same time with the condition that the input is the same size. But for our size, it's not a problem because we use just always the same key uh, in the TLS server, so always the same key to the decryption. So the size of the key and the size of the exponent is always the same. So every time the attacker tries to send us something, we use always the same size. So with that, uh, we should be kind of fine. Uh, so I'm not going through the details of that. Uh, but what happened is that uh, we went from one function uh, to compute uh, you know, uh, a signature or a encryption decryption to uh, a function of about 10 lines, as we saw in the example, to eight functions for a total of about 100 lines. So that's kind of tenfold again. And to change uh, the padding function, which was also one of the easiest to, to break uh, with you know, non, non uh, uh, side channel resistant functions. Uh, so about 20 lines to two functions for the lines. So by the end of the work, which lasted a little bit more than a month, uh, we ended up with almost 40 commits uh, with the upstream container uh, as part of this CD. And I just want to show you a small example of what we had to do. Because this was actually really hard, I have to say. Uh, really hard, not because uh, the code is necessarily any harder than any other code, but because you have to really put yourself in a mental state where you consider every possibility. Like when I say that you cannot run stuff that have two different types, it means you cannot use conditions. You cannot say if the key is larger than this, or if you know the key has a one, and then do something or do something else, because you have taken two branches in the code, and that is measurable. The attacker could force the code out of the memory, just one of the two branches, and then measure which branch you took in the CPU. So it will know if the first bit was one or zero, if the second was one or zero, third, blah, 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 and then you can recover the key. This is simplified, it doesn't work like that, but that's what happens. So you have to basically break your mind and find ways to do conditionals without doing conditionals. And this is kind of deceiving and I'm going to show you why. Memcopy is conditional here. You have to realize this condition and I try to fix. So this is just what happens at the end of uh, the PKCS1 padding or de-padding function in this case when you want to remove the padding and find, find a message. As I said, because RSA uses fixed size keys, you have to use some padding and then you write, the rest is the message, okay? And the way the PKCS1 did that is really, really bad. Uh, don't use PKCS1 anymore. There is other stuff. But it basically has this little header. Then there's a bunch of padding that you don't know how, how long it is. Then there is a terminator, let's say. It's a zero byte. And then you have your message. Now, if you just go normally like we did before, and you say, bunch of functions to find where the terminator is, all those functions are, have timing attacks. So you have to resolve that. But assume you resolve that. Then you're left with, oh, I need to copy the message in the buffer to return to the application, right? But if you do that, I'm measurable. Because if you cause the, the decrypted message before the padding is done to be forced out of memory or out of the cache, then this mem copy will just load the last part of the buffer in memory. And then again, the attacker can find out the length. And from the length, can find a bunch of information. So we have to copy that buffer into the destination buffer, always at this, with the same uh, amount of operation, regardless of the length of the message. The message could be long, you know, the whole thing, or just be one byte. And so we end up with this thing. 
which I don't know how to describe, but it's really not, not cool, not nice. Notice that I'm cheating. I'm using also things called Kanban copy, which are special main copy functions uh, that will, depending on the first parameter, copy to the destination buffer what's in the destination buffer or what's in the source buffer. Again, in a way that an attacker cannot check from where you copy it. So that's already cheating here. But again, in the end, what happens, you have a logarithmic uh, uh, time function where you end up copying the whole buffer, one byte, two bytes, four bytes, 16 bytes, and so on, and so on, until you copy it all. And hopefully, <laughs> if you got it right, it always takes the same time, regardless of the length of the, mass, uh, of the buffer. And so, yeah. Like, just look at this one. This one, it was an if-then-else statement. Now it's hopefully not conditional, and still provides the length out as a condition. So yeah, uh, it's, it's bad. So from a naive to reasonably secure implementation, we increased, you know, from the just the basic RSI function all the way to the latest uh, hand latest attacks, two order magnitudes more code, which is quite a bit. And the takeaway for me is, you know the you know the, the saying you know, uh, good cheap uh, uh, fast choose two. Uh, in, in the security case, it's almost like. <laughs> Choose one. It's either fast, 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 very, very, very secure, or very, very simple. Uh, but you can't have even two. Or rather, you have to have a compromise, usually between speed and security. But every time you know security is broken, you just have to give up speed too. Right? You just have to deal with it. Uh, and so this is it for me. Questions? Thank you very much. Just uh, not a question, but a small remark. Uh, though OpenSSL did not issue, uh, didn't raise uh, CV, uh, they immediately fixed uh, the set shadow uh, local attack. Uh, well, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the commit was on the same day when uh, the paper was published. Thank you. So the question, the, well, no, the remark was uh, although OpenSSL did not publish a CV, they actually fixed it the same day. So we were in contact as well with the same researchers, and your statement is true. I will have to say, though, that OpenSSL decided not to raise a CV by changing the definition of their threat model, saying, you know, local attacks are not a threat model for OpenSSL. I reviewed their, their changes. Uh, they were lucky that they already had done a bunch of uh, side channel resistant uh, changes in their math library before also in RSA, uh, so they had less code to write. However, I'm not 100% confident that they also did get right the patches they did. Uh, I didn't look at the assembly, I looked at the patches, and they basically ended up doing what I would have done to some degree in my first revision that I did for Nettle, but we did a second revision for Nettle before we went public. Um, so it's really hard <coughs> to get this thing right. I don't think we got it right in Nettle either. There are probably some compiler optimization that we were not we were not able to be able to defeat. Maybe they are we defeated them on x sixty four, but not not the CPU. So it's really really hard. And one of the issues is that we don't have any test to figure out whether timing attacks like these are really defeated or not because it's very hard to also write uh, attacks to this. So yeah, that's right. But they changed the definition. Right? Okay. I think we're out of time. Thank you.